Well, let's open our Bibles to Titus in chapter 2. And we want to look in the verses, especially verses 6 and 7, but really the statements in chapter 2 and chapter 3 will serve as the basis for the message. Uh, we've been talking about the gospel throughout the month of December, and we mentioned last week when we talked about John 3, 16, that Christ, he said, you believe in me, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, that does not just pertain to life after death. A person, their life can disintegrate right here before them, or as they live in the world, our lives can be blessed and we can be used and have a very uh, meaningful and purposeful life here as we live in the earth. And we talked about what needs to happen if we're to experience that abundant life. Jesus is not just interested in giving us quantity, length of life, longevity of life, but quality of life as well. So how do we experience that? Well, we talked about the need to be grateful, to be humble, to be prayerful. But today I want to talk about this particular subject, and then next week there's a couple of more we'll mention. But today we consider purity. Now let's think of this subject of purity. Jesus, it didn't take him very long to get into this subject once he began his public ministry. When he gives the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, he stresses, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So Christ delves right into the issue of purity. But unfortunately for us, a lot of times our perspective of purity is limited because we're limited just to the sexual area of life. And think about purity in that area. And to be very frank and pointed, the Bible certainly speaks about that and tells us to be that way. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that your body, if you're a believer, is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God? And it says, flee immorality. And it gives that statement, flee immorality because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It says, do you not know you've been bought with a price? You're not your own. Not any longer, not after you've come to Christ. And then if you look, we're here in Titus. If you can look 2 Thessalonians or 1 Thessalonians, it's pretty close by. Look over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and look what the Apostle Paul writes there. Beginning in verse 3, he says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passion and lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so, yes, the Bible stresses moral purity, sexual purity. Now, sex inside of marriage is wonderful. It should be engaged in. It's the most intimate way people can express love for one another. A husband and wife can. So, yes, that's blessed of God and honored of God. But uh, men can certainly twist that and turn that and, and bring destructive habits into their lives. Now, I know in this day and age in which we live, people say, well, it's the new time in which we're living and things that used to be wrong are not wrong any longer. And it's like we've invented new ways of sex. Oh, well, that's a joke. I'm reading in the book of Genesis right now. I've started reading through the Bible again this year. And I'm just amazed already. And reading, I'm over in the 40th chapter. But reading through Genesis, just in those first chapters, how many episodes of illicit sexual activity take place. And the Bible doesn't cover this up. It just shows. And it shows the pain and the heartache that can come from that. So, yes, moral purity. But I want to delve deeper than that. That's not a big enough view of purity. And uh, when you think about morality, don't just limit it to the sexual area of life. Uh, people, unfortunately, when they think about purity, they don't look at it like this. There is purity in doctrine, in your belief system. That affects all areas of our lives. Now, if you look here in verse 6 and 7 of Titus chapter 2, it says, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled and everything set an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity. Well, one translation, and here's what it's talking about. It says, in your teaching, be pure in doctrine. And that's what the integrity is. Don't just be sincere about what you're teaching because you can be teaching something that's wrong and be sincere in that belief. But he's talking about purity of doctrine. 
what God says is correct, what the Bible says. Look, there are all sorts of opinions out here about what's true, what's not true, what's right, what's wrong. We live in a day and age when people will say this to you. Well, this may be right for you, but it's not for me. And this may be right for me, but it's not for you. And we set up all these loose standards. Well, that's not what the Scripture says. And all the evidence, if people will explore it, point to the Bible as being the Word of God. The Koran is not the Word of God. Other religious books are not. The Bible is the Word of God. And his standard about all issues in life which he covers, whether it's sex, whether it's finances, whether it's relationships, whether it's you're dealing with him, he covers every area of life. How to handle money, he covers all of that. And purity in doctrine means I agree with what he says is truth. And I don't dispute what he says, and I don't set up my own standard of truth. And so that's what he's calling for here when he says in your teaching, show purity in doctrine, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about you. Now, People in our times don't want to agree with things that I've just said because they want to say it is unreasonable. It is completely unreasonable to believe that one set of religious beliefs should be exclusively true. It's just unfair to say that. And uh, their thinking is if one, one religious belief, one system of belief is the only one that's true, it would mean that billions of people in all these other religions and in all their beliefs are wrong. And there are a whole lot of people that don't want to say that. They just say, no, nah, that's uh, we can't go with that. And they'll be very quick to point out, that, listen, in, in all religions there's some element of truth because most every religion will agree with the fact that stealing, for example, is wrong. And they will say if there's some element of truth in that religion then it's got to be okay. All religions have some element of truth, so all religions are okay. But the Bible and Jesus Christ himself underscore that is not so. In fact, no one was more exclusive in their teaching than was the Lord Jesus. He pointed, he said, I'm here to fulfill the word of God. The law and the prophets, I will fulfill them. He doesn't talk about other religious beliefs other systems of teachings, he says this. And Christ very pointedly said, I'm the only way you can get to God. I'm the only way. You can't come any other way. And all these different groups want to say, well, yes, there are many roads, many paths to God. And Jesus stands to a lost world and says, that is incorrect. Now, why is it so very important when you think about this subject of purity, that it all begins here with this purity and doctrine. Why is that so essential? Because for our well-being, our spiritual well-being, but I want to go even further than that. Our spiritual well-being, our moral well-being, our physical well-being, our mental well-being, psychological, emotional well-being, all of that is crucial. And it's dependent upon if we have purity of doctrine. It truly is. It does matter what we believe. Now, some of these people say, well, it doesn't. It's, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, for example, so what if somebody tells a little white lie? That's okay. It's no big deal. Well, let somebody tell a lie about them and then see what they say. And especially let them lie to them about their money and see how they handle that. Then their attitude suddenly changes. It's very quick to change. You know, in our times right now, we stress, oh, it's the economy. That's all you're going to hear in political years when people start running for the presidency, the economy. Well, certainly you want to deal with the economy, but I'll tell you what, it'll be a world better if people dealt with purity and doctrine from what the Bible says is correct. If people just told the truth in their business dealings, in their financial dealings, you wouldn't have any Enrons. You wouldn't have any scams like the Bernie Madoff scam. And people shysed it out of billions of dollars. You wouldn't have any of that if people just told the truth. If they lived by doctrinal purity. So yes, it would make an impact there. And then you think about just our lives and what we experience in life. And any realm that you want to think about. 
whether it's marriage, sex, children, drugs, business dealings. Listen, decisions that we make determine destiny. They determine our destiny. And you have the wrong doctrine, and you can make the wrong decisions and bring great heartache upon your life. I got a call early this morning about a gentleman who he'd come to church here on Wednesday night some with his daughters. And the man had a major drug problem throughout his life. He's in his 50s. His two daughters, one of his daughters was saved. She's had a miraculous turnaround. She's got a job now. I mean, it's wonderful what Christ has done in her life. Well, this man was in the hospital at St. Anthony, and they asked me to go and see him. And I went out there, and one of our families had already witnessed to him, and I went out there and witnessed to him again. And he did accept Christ in the hospital room. And he came some on Wednesday night here. But here he is. He's a baby Christian. And let me tell you, you don't just zip right out of some of these addictions that you've had. You can get out of them, but you've got to deal with it. Well, this man still struggled with drugs. And the call I got this morning said he died yesterday of an overdose. So decisions determine destiny. And if I'm going to make right decisions, I need to have purity of doctrine. I need to know what God says is true and what God says is wrong. And then you think about this. People say in these times, well, you shouldn't legislate morality, but we do legislate morality. But whose morality is being legislated? That's the question. Because what about in the issue of abortion? There's some so-called morality that's been legislated, but it's very immoral. And here, human life, that's, that's vital. That's essential. And yet, legislation has been made that human life could be ended. And people now talk about euthanasia. What about older people in their open years? How about let's just take away their life? Well, their life's just as precious as your life. So we can do those things. And you get out of a pure doctrine And start establishing in your own mind what you think is right and what you think is wrong. And not what God says is right and what God says is wrong. And you can come up with things like this that will affect millions of people. Millions, millions, over 50 million have lost their lives as little babies. Because legislation has been made that abortion is all right. And then what about this? In 1857, there was a Dred Scott case. This is a decision rendered by the Supreme Court, and here's what the decision said. That blacks are not citizens, but they are property of their slave owners. What kind of morality is being legislated there? Is that based on the truth of God's word? It most certainly is not. Whether a person's black, white, brown skin, red skin, it doesn't matter. They're not to be a slave. God freed the slaves in the book of Exodus. Freed Freed the Hebrew children who were slaves. Every life is valuable and precious and is of the same worth before the Lord. And yet here, the Supreme Court in 1857 made that kind of decision. And they're making a decision not based on doctrinal purity. Look at all the heartache that has come through the years that we still wrestle with in these times. And what about truth and religion? People say, well, look, it's, if you have your own religious beliefs, I have my own religious beliefs, and it, it truly doesn't matter. Well, it, it does matter. It certainly does matter. In Saudi Arabia, they teach children, and some of those children are being taught that Jewish people are pigs and that non-Muslims are infidels and they should be exterminated. Their life should be ended. Is that okay? Some people say, well, you know, it's their religious belief. I tell you what, they change their tune when some of these kids grow up and they start flying planes into buildings and killing thousands of people or strapping bombs to themselves and going into a crowded area and detonating it and destroying so many lives. Doctrinal purity matters in that. Uh, The Nazis, they taught that the Aryan race was superior and the Jews were inferior. Where did they get that? Whose doctrine is that? That's not God's doctrine. That's not purity in doctrine. And millions lost their lives over that. These things do matter. And, you know, we look and we'll think, well, now that's terrible. Uh, Saudis teach their children that uh, little Jew, the Jews 
are, are pigs, but in our curriculum in the United States, in some of these universities and in some classrooms, because we teach a one-sided biology curriculum, uh, we teach that there's no difference between a pig and a human because humans aren't made special according to some and their belief system and that uh, it's just a naturalistic process and no, this business about God creating human beings in His image, special and unique, no, they don't. And so that brings confusion. In India, we have Jessica Wilson's over in India right now. The Hindu culture over there, they believe in karma and they believe in reincarnation. And I was told years ago when I was a student at Baylor, a family that I knew took a trip to India. And when they came back, they, the man tried to give a testimony to our college department in Columbus Avenue Baptist Church in Waco, and he just started crying. Because he said people would die on the streets over there, and they'd come along with a street cleaner, just sweep them up like they're trash. And you'd think, well, how in the world, why couldn't those people over there be compassionate to the poor and to the suffering? Why wouldn't they be? Well, because of their belief system. In the Hindu belief, they believe in reincarnation and they think, well, these people are suffering the way they're suffering because of some wrong that they've done in a past life. And if we reach out to help them, we're interfering with karma. So we can't do that. And so people want to say, well, doctrinal belief doesn't matter. Well, you're wrong if you feel that way. Doctrinal belief, purity in doctrine matters. It impacts every single area of our lives for our well-being as a total person. It is important that we have purity in our beliefs. And then also for this reason, so that we can set the proper examples. Look what it says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 7. He says, In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. Well, if your doctrine is not right, you're not going to do good in the way that Jesus wants it. And I'm not saying people who don't believe in Jesus Christ can't do some good things. Well, they can. They can raise money to give food to people that are hurting, that are hungry, to give medicine. And all that's important. It's good. They can even take care of animals. That's good, too. It's wonderful. But all that's temporal. It's just temporary. And Christ calls us for more than that. He says, be an example so that can, people can be impacted, not just in the immediate moment, but eternally. And a person, their doctrine's not pure. They're not going to impact anyone eternally. They will not. To be an example that we need to be, he says, purity of doctrine. But then listen, purity of doctrine affects our relationships. When you think about relationships, you need to think about terms like thought, our thought life, our speech, our attitudes that we take, conduct, conduct that we demonstrate toward one another. Uh, he says here, I'm not going to read all these verses, but he, he talks to older women, to younger women, to young men, to older men. He even says, if you're in a situation where you are a slave, not that he was condoning slavery, this is in verse, verse 9, but he's saying if you're in that situation, here's how you need to live. Here's what you need to do. And then he refers to the example of the Lord Jesus. And then he tells us in chapter 3, we need to be subject to rulers and authorities and be obedient and be ready to do whatever is good. But all these things talk about relationships, the way we live our lives, the interaction with people, and the relationships we have. And especially I want us to think about family relationships and think about husband and wife. Look what it says over here in Ephesians in the fourth chapter. Ephesians chapter 4. And there's some verses here that I want you to look at. Because look, in relationships, in family relationships, uh, it's just, it's hard. It's hard. I see so many people that just struggle. And anyone that's in a marriage relationship, look, it's going to be tough. Some of you sitting here this morning, you have tough situations in your marriage. And it's just hard. But I want to tell you, don't think you're alone. And don't think, well, most people in here, they've never had any problems in their marriage. That's a joke. Every couple in here have had issues in their marriage. Every single couple. A lady told me this week, and she, is one of the, <laughs> she and her husband are one of the finest couples that I know. They're great leaders. They have a wonderful relationship, wonderful family. And she told me years ago, 
She said, my husband and I were not getting along. We thought we weren't supposed to be together. She said, my husband was looking in the Bible to find an excuse to divorce me. And they're some of the finest people that I know. Listen, anyone can go through hard times. Because when we come into a relationship, we bring our own baggage, we bring our, our own ideas and, and our attitudes and all this, and all of us need to have correction, and it's a process through a lifetime to make those corrections. Well, I'll tell you what, when trouble comes up in marriage, there are some things that will not work and will not solve the issue and will not help you have a healthy relationship. And let me just list some of them real quick for you. One is this, silence. Well, I just won't talk to them. I'm not going to, won't do any good. I'm not going to talk to them and explain to them what I'm feeling and how they've hurt me. It just won't do any good, so I'll just be silent. Well, that's not going to correct anything. If that's you, then you're not helping the situation. Here's something else that won't help, sarcasm. Just being sarcastic to your loved one. And you can, you can do that, that won't help. This won't help either if you sabotage, and you can, you can sabotage the relationship. You can say things about your mate to other people or even to them that just undercut any chance of you having a good relationship. Or there's this, screaming. Getting into it and just screaming and yelling at each other. And you may never become physically violent, but you can become verbally violent. And a lot struggle with that. But look what he says here. And look, at all this comes back to doctrinal purity. Do you believe what God says is right or not? You're going to do it your way, you're going to do it his way. Look what it says here in verse 26 of chapter 4. It says, in your anger, now he says, he doesn't tell you you can't ever be angry because there is such a thing as a righteous anger if someone's done something that's wrong. But he says, in your anger, do not sin. And he says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. If there's an anger that's come up because your mate's done something wrong or they're mad at you because you've done something wrong, we need to deal with that. You don't need to go to try to go to sleep or just harbor that for days and weeks and months. He says, don't let the sun go down on that anger. And he says, do not give the devil a foothold. That's exactly what you're doing when you allow this to happen. Now look what it says down here in verse 31. He says this, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger. And you think, well, wait a second. He just said up here, uh, in your anger, don't sin. So there's a righteous anger, but now there's another kind of anger that's unrighteous and unholy because he says, get rid of this anger. Get rid of it. But a person who has bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, let me tell you what, they can get in some screaming matches. They truly can. I mean, consistently scream. Any little thing come up, they start yelling at each other. Time after time after time, consistently doing that, if you think you're helping the situation there, you're not. That's not improving anything. And then uh, what about this just improper speech? Look what he says. Look up in verse 25. He says in 25th verse, let each one of you put off falsehood and speak truthfully. Uh-oh, this is a moral issue. This is a doctrinal issue. Am I going to be truthful or am I going to tell falsehoods? Purity in doctrine leads to this. He says you need to be truthful in your speech. And then look what he says in verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. You do grieve him. When, when you do those things. Let me tell you something, an unwholesome word, you don't have to be screaming to say an unwholesome word. You can just say something that's real bad to your mate. You can curse them. You can do all sorts of things. And look, all people struggle with these kinds of things, and this is what we need to be prayerful about, but this is where we need to come back to a place of doctrinal purity. 
If there's not doctrinal purity, where we're saying, all right, Lord, here's what you say, and I agree with what you say is true, and even though I have all these feelings that make me want to lash out and rage, if I've done that, I want to confess that, and I want to pray to you, and I want to seek your help to help me be more controlled and to help me be what I'm supposed to be. And I'm just saying to you, if husbands and wives did this, a lot of marriages right now that seem irreconcilable could be reconciled. They could not only reconcile, they could flourish if people would just do these things. And yet, wonder of wonders, this all comes back to purity. Doctrinal purity, what you believe. What do you believe is the truth? And the Bible says God's Word is, if I'm to be doctrinally pure, that it means in any area of life, whatever I'm dealing with, whether it's marriage, whether it's finances, whether it's a, a business relationship, whatever it might be, my attitudes. Lord, I've got to look in your Word. Your Word tells me the truth about all these things, and I need to try and line my life up. I need to let your Spirit so empower me that my life could be lined up in this way. Listen, if we don't, if we don't, then just like the tragedy that happened to the man that I just told you about that overdosed, he accepted Christ, but he never got away from that problem, and it cost him his life. You get involved in impure belief systems, and it can cost you your marriage, it can cost you financially. It can cost you your reputation. It can destroy your life. And that is not the plan of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have no intention of that happening to you. He said, my purpose is that you might have life and have it abundantly. Not just longevity of life. I want you to have quality of life. But if that's going to happen, there must be purity of doctrine in our thinking. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> well, Father, all of us struggle here. I just uh, pray for each one. Pray for myself. And Lord, help us to know the only way we're going to find truth is in your word. And Father, help us to realize in every area of life, you speak to every issue of life in the Bible. And Father, you tell us what's right and you tell us what's wrong. Now, Lord, we can get caught up out here in the world and start believing things that the world says is right that you say is wrong. And we can make a mess of things. Or, Lord, we can just humbly come before you and say, all right, Lord, I don't know, but you do. So help me to read your word. Help me to know what you say. And, Lord Jesus, give me the strength. I don't even have the strength even if I know what it is to carry it out unless you give that to me. So give me the strength. Change my life. And I pray for anyone who needs to make that kind of commitment here today as a believer that, Lord Jesus, they do that. I pray for marriages out here that may be suffering right now. And I pray for them that you just help them and uh, bless them with these teachings today. I pray that you do. And, Lord Jesus, for any in this room that do not know you as their Savior, I pray for them. I pray this could be a moment and a time of commitment for their lives. And, Lord, I ask this in your name. And while our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, in a moment we're going to be dismissed. But after we're dismissed, that doesn't mean this service is over for you. I'll be standing right here at the front. If you've never invited Jesus to come into your life and you'd like to make that decision, you can do that right now. And uh, when we've finished, I just encourage you to come forward. Just come to where I am, and we'll share with you about how you can have Christ in your life. This can be a great day of decision that changes you if, you if you trust in Jesus. You might be a believer looking for a church home, and you'd like to place your life here. If that's true, we hope that you'd come forward also.